Are you guys ready to get into the Word this morning? Let's pray. Lord, this morning we come to you and we thank you that, God, you are just like you did with the children of Israel, leading them through the wilderness. Lord, you are leading us through this book of Numbers, Lord. You're allowing us to see how you were faithful to lead them. And, and Lord, you're allowing us to see their stubbornness. You're allowing us to see their dependency on you and then the, the moments where they were not dependent on you. And, and Lord, we thank you that we get to see, Lord, this, this struggle that they constantly had. And Lord, we know that it can be a struggle for ourselves to rely on you, to depend on you, to, to even, as we talked about last Sunday, to go back to the way it was before we were walking with you, Lord. We can even be tempted to go back to when we were stuck in sin and and Lord, this morning we ask just that you again, through the power of your word, would remind us of all that we have in you, all that you've done for us. And as we, even this morning, partake of communion, Lord, may we be reminded of this new covenant that we get to walk within. So meet us in your word this morning, God. We thank you again that we can open it here in a public gathering, that we can say the name of Jesus in a public setting. And would you meet us with your love, your strength, your hope, your peace this morning. And uh, Lord, again, as we just sang, have your way, not only in this place, but have your way in our hearts. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Numbers 13 and 14, we're going to get through a little bit of 14 as well this morning. Hopefully we'll see. Uh, again, we are making kind of a, a, a fast trek through the book of Numbers. And again, a challenge and encouragement to all of you to dig deeper, to take the opportunity to go throughout this week and dig in more if you feel like you need to see more. Uh, but as we, we read through last week, we, we looked at uh, this change that started to take place, this change within the hearts of the people. And we saw that they started to grumble, complain, to murmur, and even we saw they began to rebel against the Lord. And, uh, and this complaining is going to continue throughout. It's almost as if Glenn and I were just talking in the back before service and he made it a point. It's almost like they could not, com- not complain. It was this constant, there was, they could not break free from this complaining and grumbling. And a- as we go into 13, we're going to see that this complaining is going to uh, get in the way of a lot of things. We talked about that last Sunday, just as far as the, the uh, mindset that we can fall into when we start to complain and the dangers of complaining. And uh, many of you, you know, I, I couldn't believe how many of you still submitted complaints last Sunday in the complaint box <laughs> and, um, and still listened to those complaints as they went into the complaint box that's really a paper shredder and you continue just to put them in there even though they were getting shredded and we never read them. But um, again, we know complaints are not good. And complaining is not good. But here we're going to find them approach what God has been promising them. They're going to approach the promised land. And they are very close to being able to enter the promised land. But we're going to see things drastically change for the children of Israel. And these two chapters, for me, uh, are hard chapters to read through because they are... It, there, you, you read, we're going to read through these chapters and it's, it's a major letdown. And it's very sad to see what happens to Israel going forward because of their hearts. I almost, when I was reading through the past couple of weeks of these two chapters and studying through it, I started to really find myself grieving for them. Uh, of the fact of how uh, their hearts had in such a way caused them to miss out on what God had in store for them. And again, all the things that we can miss out that God has in store for us. So, are you guys ready? ready. Okay. Numbers 13, verse 1 says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them goes through, lists these specific men who are going to be selected to be the spies that will go out and spy out the land. And we're going to jump down to verse 17. 
says, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the, uh, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds. Verse 20. And whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehom near Lebo Hamath, and they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, Ahaman and Shishiah and Talmai. These again, these are great baby names if you're pregnant, that you want to take note of. And the descendants of Anak were there in Hebron, was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt, and they came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. And they also brought some pomegranates and figs. Verse 24, the place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. We'll stop here just for a moment. I think it's very important that we see uh, these men as they're going out to spy out the land that we, we see um, very specific men that were selected, but we also see a very specific task that was given. Moses heard from the Lord, and Moses uh, sent them out to spy out the land, and he gave specific instructions to them. He wanted to know in verse 18 if the people were strong or weak. He wanted to know as well in verse 18 if they were few or many. He wanted to know in verse 19 if the land was good or bad. He wanted to know if the cities, in verse 19, were camps or were they strongholds. He wanted to know, in verse 20, if the land was rich or poor. And interesting, he wanted to know if the land had trees or not. And, and Moses gives these specific things to look for. And we know this, that verse 1 starts off with what we've seen through the book of Numbers and also through the book of Leviticus and also through Exodus, that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and this is what the Lord wanted. He wanted him to send these men. Now, um, when Moses gives these specific instructions, now these could have been relayed to Moses from the Lord, what to look for, but some of these things I look at and I wonder, were these things that Moses, specifically maybe not the Lord had told Moses to look for, but maybe Moses wanted to know? Because God was very clear, as we're going to see, what the land would be like. So for Moses to say, I want to know this and this and this and this, uh, and these men go on this mission and they're told to bring back not only some fruit, but they're told to bring back a report on all of these things. And, and they go forth. These guys are faithful to go out on this mission. They go out as spies. And then we're going to pick up in verse 25. Or first, let me say this before we move on to verse 25. If you notice in 23, some of the things they bring back. We see they bring back this cluster of grapes, and they also bring back pomegranates and figs. And I think it's important to look at this because this, again, reminds us of the goodness of God. If you remember last week, we looked at the fact that they were complaining, and they were complaining about their misfortunes. Supposedly, they, they felt they had misfortunes along the way, and... and Misfortunes. when really we looked at the fact that they were delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery. They're, if you remember, we looked at um, back in chapter 1 of Exodus that their ba male babies were being killed by the Egyptians. The Pharaoh ordered that decree that all male babies of the Hebrews were to be thrown into the Nile. They were to be killed. And we saw that their, their taskmasters enslaved them even more and made things even more difficult. And then we found Israel being freed from that and Last week, we looked at the fact that they were discouraged and complaining about the manna. And they just wanted to get back. If you remember, let's see, can you guys remember what they were craving from Egypt? Cucumbers, onions, garlic, and one more, leeks. You guys are good. Okay. 
So again, not really like the list of things I'm, I would write down and say I want for my one last meal. Or could you imagine a prisoner and, you know, one last meal? I want leeks, garlic, onions. Or for my birthday meal, I want leeks, garlic, onions. Here God is showing them his goodness and they bring back grapes, pomegranates, and figs. And I believe it's God saying, hey, let me just give you a little taste of my goodness. Let me show you what awaits you. You were complaining last week about the manna and you were, had cravings for onions and garlic and, and things that were in Egypt. And, and now I'm going to let you just have a little sample of my goodness. And it kind of just, this is a, for me, it reminded me of this. This is how my mind works, but you guys probably know how my mind works, many of you. Remind me of Costco. Okay, so we all know there's going to be Costco in heaven, right? We, we know as, as soon as we get there, there'll be a Costco and a Home Depot and an in and out but, but many of you are like me. You go into Costco and, and you uh, are very uh, frugal, which is, a, I think, a blessing from the Lord, being frugal. And you say, you know what, I am going to compile my entire lunch for free today from all of these people that are just there ready to serve me little samples, right? And we go around and we, we take a sample, we eat it, and then if we have kids, we send them back to get a sample for us. And, and by the time we're done at Costco, we've eaten for free. You know, if, and guys, if you are looking to win over a, a, a lady, you know, Costco, I'm telling you, free dinner. If you just buy a bag of popcorn, you can buy a bag of popcorn, then you can go over to where the TVs are and you can sit on one of their, their nice couches and watch a movie. I mean, it's right there, free Except for the popcorn, it's pretty much a free date. But those samples, they tell us, here, here's a little sample of what you're going to get. And, and I believe this was God saying, this is just a little taste of what's to come. And they bring it back. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And I love that they, they're getting these little samples to take back and to say, look, now we've got these pomegranates, we've got these grapes, we have these figs. When just not too long before this, they were found themselves grumbling and complaining. And God's saying, here's just a little sample. A little sample. Look at verse 25. At the end of 40 days, 40 days they, they spied out the land. It's a long trip. 40 days after the end of 40 days, they returned, verse 25, and spry, uh, spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So here they are, they're coming back, they're giving report. And the first thing they want to mention is, this is the land, this is what you sent us to, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of the land. They are saying right now to Moses, it's just like God said it would be. It flows with milk and honey. It's flowing with it. And again, here they were previously complaining about not having anything but this manna. And, and God's showing these men this land and they're bringing back this, this report to Moses and the whole congregation. And the first thing they, they confirm is, yes, it has what the Lord said it would have. It flows with milk and honey. But look at verse 28. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites, verse 29, dwell in the land of the Nagab. And the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites and the Mosquito Bites and the Spider Bites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. They come back and they say, hey, it, it's just as God said it would be. It's flowing with milk and honey. However, the people are strong. The cities are fortified. They're large. We can't come against those cities. The descendants of Anak are there. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites are there. There's no way. 
It's interesting that they start out with the report with saying what, confirming what God said it would be like, flowing with milk and honey. But then their conclusion is, it's just as God said it would be, but we can't get it. Because they're too strong, because there's too many, because the cities are fortified, because the descendants of Anak are there, because the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites are there. Yes, it's just like God said it would be, but there's no way for us to get it because we can't do it. It's interesting, Genesis 17.8, if you want to write this down, Genesis 17.8 says, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you, speaking to Abraham, God was, the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Leviticus 20.24 20, says, But I have said to you, you shall inherit the land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. Turn with me to Exodus, two books back. Exodus chapter 23. And this however is very similar to like them saying, but, you know, but we can't. However, you know, hey, there's good news. It's just like God said it would be. However, it's scary. There's all these reasons we can't do it. And those two verses in Genesis and Leviticus, again, God told them what it would be like. God told them what it would have, what it would be flowing with. Genesis 23, and we'll pick up in, or sorry, Exodus 23, and we'll pick up in verse uh, 30. Let me know if you guys are there. All right. Genesis, tw or <laughs> Exodus 30, verse 23. It says, little by little, I will dry them out. 23, chapter 23, verse 30. There we go. Okay. I'm not with you guys, but I'm, I'm, I don't know where I am. Okay. Little by little, I want you to keep in mind and keep track of the word I. Okay? Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Verse 31, and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God, again, here in Exodus 23, is letting them know this is what awaits you. And he says some key things here. I will. I will do it. I will. Not you. I will. I'm going to give it to you. In fact, in, in, in chapter 23 of Exodus, he says some other things. He says, I will blot them out concerning their enemies. He also said, I will throw them into confusion. He said that he would send terror before them. To their enemies. And then he said, I will make all your enemies turn their backs toward you. God was saying, I will do this. So it's so, it, it, I don't understand what the disconnect here is for these spies when they come back and say, it's just like God said it would be, but we can't get it. When God, not only did he say it would be flowing with milk and honey, but he also said, I will give it to you. Yes, there's going to be enemies. I will blot them out. I will drive them out. It's going to be yours. I'm going to let those people get the land fertile and perfect for you. And, and those people who are evil and full of wickedness are going to be driven out. And it will be rightly yours. I will allow you to possess the land and inherit the land. So why were they in agreement with the yes, it flows with milk and honey, just like he said it why couldn't they also say, and we're going to possess it because he said we would? It's very kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Peter. You remember Peter seeing Jesus walk on the water? I, I, I love that account in the Gospels because just think of, of, of you being in that boat. 
and all of a sudden seeing Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. And first we know they were frightened, thinking, who is this guy? Is it a ghost? And, and, and Jesus approaches them, and Peter, again, Peter we know was a guy who was not afraid just to say what was in his mind. Many times that got him in trouble, and the first thing in his mind was, uh, 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 that's truly you, I want to walk on water. You let me get down and walk on water. Jesus says, okay. All right, Peter, come on out. Come on out, buddy. You got this. I'm with you. I'm right here. You're going you're to walk to me, Peter. I'm obviously, this isn't what Jesus said, but this is along the lines and paraphrasing here. Peter gets out, we know, and he starts to walk on water. He starts to walk on that water, and then we know as the, the tempest of the storm grew and the waves grew bigger, and Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and put them on to the waves and the current storm and circumstances, what happened to Peter? He began to sink. He began to become filled with fear, and that fear started to squash the faith that he had to get out of the boat in the first place. Here God is taking them. He, he's delivered them from Egypt. He's bringing them to the promised land. They're right there. They've spied out the land. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's just like he said it would be. But we can't do it. We can't do it. This brings us to point number one this morning. And, and if you're wondering how long this message is going to be, there's only 15 points. So um, point number one is this. God is going to do it. He's going to do it. Just like he said he was going to do it. God told them it would have the milk and honey. God told them he would drive them out. He would give them the land that they would possess it and inherit it. And God was going to do it. And this morning, maybe you need to be reminded that God is going to do it. He's going to do it. And that, that isn't a false message of hope or prosperity to you, but that is a statement that God will do it. He will make it happen. If he said he will do it, he will do it. If Jesus said, I go to a place to prepare, I go there to prepare a place for you, a room for you, and I will return to gather you, and then I will bring you with me, and you will be where I am. If Jesus said that, guess what? It's going to happen. Right now, he is preparing a place for you and I. Amen? Amen? He's there preparing a place. He's waiting for the father to say, Hey, son, you get to go and get your bride. It's time to go. And Jesus will say, Amen, God. Amen, Father. I'm going now. We're going to meet him in the clouds. And we will be with him. That will happen. If he said he was going to drive them out, just like he said there would be milk and honey, so sad that these men allowed the inhabitants of the land to fill them with fear. We just started a little series with our youth on Tuesday nights, and it's called You Say, God Says. And they're just statements and script scriptures from the Bible and statements we might make. And and we talked about this this past Tuesday, that we might say, I can't figure it out. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I think of Israel, and they probably looked and said, too big, too, you know, giants in the land, the city's huge, there's walls. Um, so, some uh, commentators state that there could have been some of these cities, walls that were 30 to 50 feet tall. They're looking and thinking, okay, all we know is tents. And these are walls. How are we going to get over them? How are we going to get through them? Uh, they're looking at militaries and thinking, well, we'll think, just remember, God, the book of Numbers, take into account six, over 600,000 men ready and able to go to war Israel had. We can't do it. We can't do it. We're not going to be able to do it. God was going to do it. And God is going to do We might say, we can't figure it out, I don't know how. And, and what would God say to that statement? Well, he would say this. Many of us know this verse. Some of you, it's your life first. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct or make straight your paths. He will show you how to figure it out. 
He will show you what to do, what steps to take. God will do it. Second thing we see here is attitude, I think, can truly be everything. And I believe these men entered this mission with a bad attitude. Remember, we just finished last week looking at their attitude, complaining, grumbling. Uh, If we could just go back to Egypt, can we just go back to that place, man, we ate for free? Now that is tempting. For those of you that are college students here, eating for free is is a tempting thing. And you're like, I could eat all I want for free. But what they weren't thinking was, I can eat all I want for free, but then I'm going to be beaten and oppressed and chained up, and then our own babies are going to be killed. I, if I could just go back there, the food was free. And it was garlic. All the free garlic I'd want. All the free leeks I'd want. Their attitude, I believe, going into this mission already was set up to fail. I think their attitude was still stuck in that critical, complaining state of, uh, he, why did he bring us out here? He's just giving us manna. What, you know, and, and what are we going to do? I think their attitude dictated their report that they brought back to Moses. Well, yes, it's just like he said it would look like and what it would have, but no, we're not going to be able to get it. Attitude truly, I think, can be everything. And we looked at their attitude of grumbling, complaining. We looked at Miriam and and Aaron in uh, chapter 12 last week of them starting to even rebel against Moses and speak out against Moses. And I think attitude, again, it can affect so much. I want to read this to you. Um, This is from a marriage devotional. So those of you who aren't married, don't think you have to plug your ears. You can listen to this. I think it can apply to us. But Bethany and I were reading through this last night, and I just thought it was so fitting for where these spies were, these men were. And um, this is uh, by Gary Chapman. It says this, changing your attitude was last night's little devo he had. And he said this in Philippians 4, 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4, 8. And then he says this, changing your attitude can be a catalyst that sets in motion a seasonal change in your marriage. Again, take this and apply it to life. I must confess that I learned this truth the hard way. Earlier in my marriage, I spent a great deal of time in the winter season because of my negative attitudes. And when I was in the midst of winter, I found it hard to admit that my attitude was part of the problem. It was much easier to blame my wife, Caroline's behavior, So if your name is Caroline, don't worry, he's not talking about you today. He's talking about his wife. It was much easier, he said, to blame my wife Caroline's behavior. Today, I readily admit that my negative thinking was the culprit. If your relationship is filled with frustration and strain, my guess is that you too have the tendency to blame your spouse and are failing to recognize your own negative attitudes. Ouch. If you want to break free from the coldness and bitterness of a winter relationship, I challenge you to change your attitude. As long as you curse the darkness, it will get darker. But if you look for something good in your marriage, you will find it. This famous verse from Philippians 4 reminds us to fix our thoughts on good things, things that are true, right, honorable, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think this kind of focus can change the way we see everything around us. Focusing on the positive creates a warmer climate. Express appreciation to your spouse for one positive action, and you'll likely see another. I like what he said here, Gary Chapman. He said, as long as you curse the darkness, it will get darker. And here are these men. Their attitude was that of, I think, again, well, he's only giving us manna. Why did he even bring us out here? It'd be better for us to go there. Uh, And their attitude was not looking at the goodness of what God just gave them. Hey, here's some samples of what you're going to get. Don't forget, I already told you, I'm going to drive them out. I'm going to blot them out. I'm going to send terror before you. I'm going to cause your enemies to turn their backs toward you. It's yours. I think their attitude caused them to come back with this 
message to Moses of yes, but no. Yes, it's like he said it would be, but no, we can't do it. And that is God's message to us today. You're right. God would say, you can't do it. I will do it. If you're struggling with sin today, and you're trying to get out of it on your own, you can't. He has to do it. If you are in a place that you, you're in a place where maybe you've, you've dug and dug and dug and dug and tried to get out of, and, and you're, you're, you're realizing I, there's nothing I can do to get out of this, God is saying, I'm the only one that can get you out. But you've got to give me your hand. And you've got to let me have my way. Just like with Israel, they had to give God their hand and say, pull us through this and, and have your way. Do what you said you would do and, and do what you want to do in us, God. Here's what's interesting. We're going to wrap up here. If you look back in Numbers chapter 13, if you're not there, you can flip back to Numbers 13. And we'll wrap up here. As these men give this message back to Moses, of all that is in the land that God already told them would be there. I'll drive them out. They're going to be there, but I'm going to take care of them. Just like today, he tells us what lays ahead of us. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have sorrow. We're going to have struggles. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be pain, but he's going to be in the midst of it with all of those things with us. They give this report, and then if you look at verse 30 of Numbers 13... They're giving this report, and Caleb, I love this, Caleb speaks up. And it says in verse 30, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Isn't that a rad statement that Caleb just makes? These guys are like, hey, yeah, there's, well, yeah, it's got milk and honey. We brought you some fruit. But, Moses, there's no way we can get it because of the strongholds. There's no way we can get it because of the amount there's, of people. There's no way we can get it because they are strong. And Caleb's hearing this report. And you, I could just picture Caleb as they're giving this line-by-line -line item of the reasons why they can't. The excuses of why they can't do it. I could, just pack, I could just picture Caleb there with his jaw dropping more and more each time they said, we can't do it because of this, we can't do it because of this. And I could just picture Caleb standing there going, what are you talking about? Because he does not say, yeah, they're right. We should come up with a strategic plan and wait five years before we approach. Uh, they're right, there's no way we got this. Caleb says, hey, everybody, I love this. I'm just going to say something that's kind of rude. I think Caleb said, hey, would everybody just shut up? Listen, we're going to go and we're going to occupy it because we are able to overcome it. Caleb was ready to roll that moment and ready to go and get their land that God had promised them. He told us that he would give it to us. He told us he would drive them out. Let's go. We will overcome them because we are able. And I don't think Caleb was saying that in a sense of that he thought he was anything special. He had the confidence of God and knew that his faith in his God was saying, we can overcome it because our God will do it. Let's go. Why are we even standing here and talking about it? Let's go and let's get our land. Wow. I love this. And you would think and hope that all of them at this moment would say, you're right, Caleb. What were we thinking? God is, is going before us just like he has this whole time. You're right. Let's go. Let's mount up. Let's get out of here. Let's go and get our land. It's ours. All right. And then verse 31. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Gosh, it's getting bleaker and bleaker, isn't it? Remember, I love that. As Gary Chapman says, you curse the darkness, it just gets darker. Gosh, it's going to swallow us up, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. They're tall. You know what Caleb would say? 
which I tell people all the time when they come up and say, hey, how tall are you? Or, and this is a true statement. You know they say the bigger they are, the harder they fall? That is so true. When I fall, it's a hard fall. You don't want to be around when I fall. The ground kind of shakes and it's like, you know, and I've even had people walking behind me when I'm about to fall. They're like, okay, clear way, wide load, move out of the way. This guy's about to fall. I do not want to be around when he falls. Caleb, I think, would have said, hey, they're taller. Hey, remember the bigger they are, the harder they fall? I don't care if they're tall. I'm not afraid of their height. God is for us who can be against us. Oh gosh, verse 33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. These guys are huge. We, we look like tiny little grasshoppers. I, I think it's safe to admit these guys were probably big. I think so. I don't think these guys are, but I also say these guys are probably like those guys who went on the fishing trip and come home and tell you, yeah, the fish I caught, oh my gosh, it was huge. Like, you sure? I, the picture I saw looked like more like a, a sardine you pulled out of a can and put on your fish hook. Are you sure that's the fish? You, these guys, remember, the more they had this attitude of negativity, the more they found themselves saying, yeah, and the, the land is going to swallow us up. It's going to devour us. The giants, we were like little tiny grasshoppers. We, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. God's saying, yes, you're right, you can't. I already told you, I can, and I will do it. The third point before we head out this morning, I think is so important, is that as Caleb quieted these people, He tries to get them to see that, hey, don't you remember? Don't you remember what God has already said? And then these guys in verse 32, as we read, says, So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land. That brings us to, I think, our third point, that what report are we listening to today? What report are we listening to today? Are we listening to the report that we hear just on the news all day long? Are we listening to the report that we see on social media? Are we listening to the report of the people that we have around us? And if we are, then are, who's around us? Do we have faithless people around us? Or do we have faithful people around us? Do we have cynical, critical, negative people around us? Or do we have people that see the good and have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord? See, I, I want people around me to go, yeah, you're right, it is pretty bleak, those guys are pretty big, but don't you remember who we have on our side? Don't you remember what he's already done for us? See, I want a Caleb around me in the moments where, where I'm looking and saying, hey, don't you, uh, don't you remember, guys, that we are able to do this because he will drive them out, he will blot them out, he will take care of our problems, he will do it. I, we want people around us, people of faith. We don't want people around us that all they do is sit around and talk about it and never do anything about it. I'm just going to talk about it and talk about it, 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 talk about it. We want, like Elvis saying, a little less conversation and a little more action. We can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it. Really, I want somebody around me that actually has done it, that stepped out in faith and watched God provide. I want to share one story with you guys before we head out, and um, we still have to read chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 this morning, but um, uh, just a, a faith challenge for me, and some of you are completely clueless to this, but some of you who have been around for a while, you are aware of this, and I want to share this because it was a faith challenge for me and, and for the board of our church, and, and, uh, and some of you know this, but just uh, several years, well, not even too long ago, uh, about five, uh, four and a half years ago, um, we were uh, striving and doing all we could to get out of debt. We had a large amount of debt that the church was trying to get out of. And, and I remember God just, just continually putting it on my heart. We had a little bit of savings built up. And it was mainly we were holding that for property. You know, as we were looking for property. And the reality was that savings was near nothing to what would be even a down payment for property. Because property, and if you guys aren't aware commercial property in San Diego, if you're trying to buy a house right now, imagine five acres of land somewhere, or ten acres of land is, 
is crazy right now. So I really felt like the Lord saying, you know, to get out of debt, approach the people and, and let them know that, hey, if we give you everything we have in our savings and, and we let go of what we've been holding on to and give it to you, will you release us of all of our debt? And it was ha half of the amount we owed. And, and I remember talking to a pastor and just sharing with him, hey, do you think this is reckless? Do you think this is foolishness? And I remember him saying, you know what it sounds like to me? Childlike faith. He said, I think maybe you should listen to what the Lord is telling you to do and step out in faith. We prayed it over and we prayed it over and everybody got to a place where we felt like, you know what? We're just going to trust the Lord and we're going to offer it to him and see if they take it. And we offered it to him and within a half an hour we got a phone call back and they said, we will take it and you'll be forgiven of all of your debt. I thought, wow. And, and the scary part was we were giving something we were holding on to that we felt like we can't do anything in the future if we don't have this. And here's how good God is. It's been less than four and a half years and now he's replaced all of that and then some. He's pretty amazing. So the $300 we have in savings, he replenished. I mean, it was like that. It was, it was just amazing. And it was, but that is because I believe we stepped out in faith. And there, I'm going to tell you this. There are so many times where I look and I go, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think we can do it. I don't think we can do it. God, you want us to reach out to public school kids and see if they just come and sit with us for a Bible study? I don't think we can do it, God. And I will wrestle and I will wrestle and I will wrestle with it. I, I, there's no way they're going to come. There's no way, God, if we go to the police station and ask if we can help them, if they'll let us in and let us. God, there's no, and God, there's no, uh, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. If we step out in faith, I believe God honors that. And he meets us. And I love that about our church. Many of you are people that would say, What? Why aren't we going and getting what's rightfully ours? God already told us it's ours. What, 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 what are we standing around talking about this for? Let's go. Let's go. And that's what I've always loved about our church is you guys are people that are just, you know what, let's go. Oh, there's people who need help there. Let's go. You mean we have to get on a plane tomorrow? I, I, I haven't even talked to my boss to get off work, but I'll call him right now. Let's go. I'll do it. Let's roll. Let's go. I believe God honors that kind of faith and action. And it may, some of you may think that's reckless and foolishness, but I think, again, when God is saying go, we should get going. Amen? Thankfully, he is gracious. And he meets us again and says, hey, remember I told you, you could, this would happen if you just go? Remember? And he's done that so many times with, with me. Remember? Just get going. So, what report are we listening to? Who do we have around us? And then chapter 14, I'm just going to quickly overview chapter 14 for us. But chapter 14, again, the people have an opportunity. I want you guys to keep this in mind. Caleb just presented them the opportunity to go forward and go into the promised land. Now, you hear this said many times, and I say it all the time, as far as the journey from being freed from Egypt to getting to the promised land, we know would have only been about an 11-day journey by foot. And we know that the children of Israel, it took them how long? 40 years to get to the promised land, right? And a lot of times we say, you know, it took them 40 years because of their stubbornness, yes. It took them 40 years because of their foolishness, yes. Bottom line is it took them 40 years because God in chapter 14 says, you know what? You had an opportunity to have it. You had an opportunity to go in and possess it. You had an opportunity to step out in faith. You had an opportunity to trust me, but you didn't. And in chapter 14, it's a very sad chapter because it's God letting his people know that, listen, because of your rebellion and because of your attitudes of stubbornness and grumbling and complaining and because you did not go forward and possess the land, you're going to be out here for 40 years. And all of you, except Caleb and your children, are going to die off in this wilderness. And I'm going to take the next generation in. You are not even going to get to see or enter the promised land because of your stubbornness 
and hard hearts. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Mm. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the swords? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron, verse 5, fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the sons of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, verse 7, and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights, verse 8, in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to them, or then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Wow. They're ready to kill Moses. They're ready to kill Aaron. They're ready to kill Caleb. They're ready to kill Joshua. Let's stone these men. Again, Caleb's saying, guys, the land is great. He is going before us. If the Lord delights in us, he will do what he said. And again, the response is, let's find someone else to lead us back to bondage. And let's do away with these men of hope. Wow. Let's do away with these men of hope and faith. Moses, verse 13 through 19, intercedes on behalf of the people of Israel. And then in verse 20, we pick up and it says, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned. He prays for their sins to be forgiven. And the Lord says this, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly, verse 21, as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land, or I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley, valleys turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Then we see back, uh, jumping over to verse 33, And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years. And shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity. 40 years you shall know my displeasure. Wow. 40 days of spying out the land. And they come back with their bad report, their grumbling, their complaining, their rebellion against God and his appointed and the Lord says, for those 40 days, I gave you an opportunity to taste and see my goodness. You've rebelled against it. And you get a year for each of those days. And then it was crazy to close the 14. Some of the people all of a sudden think, well, no, 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 wait a second. We're going to go and fight. <laughs> we'll go get it. We'll, we'll do it our way. And they're defeated because the spirit of the Lord does not go with them. 
See, God was faithful. You might read through something like this. There's God, judgmental, angry, lied to his people. No, God never lied to his people. In fact, God said, hey, here's my covenant with you. Walk in it. And as you walk in it and live in it, it will be yours. But the moment you decide you don't want to walk in it and live in it, the moment you turn from it, it no longer will be yours. He is very clear, the moment you go and worship the gods of the land that you're going into, the moment that you do this is the moment that you're, you're turning your back on me and the covenant that I have with you. You're my people, you're set apart. I've freed you, I've delivered you. Why would you ever go and cling to anything but me? And I love this morning, I'm gonna ask the men to come forward and we're gonna pass out the elements for communion. I love this morning that we have this new covenant. That's all based on who? Do you guys know? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. All based on his blood that was shed for us. Amen? Amen. All based on the work of the cross and his resurrection from the tomb. New covenant that we have entered into. All the work has been done by Jesus. So if Jesus says that if we are faithful to confess our sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive us of our, our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. If Jesus says, because of this new covenant, I'm going to do this, he will do it. And this morning, maybe you've been trying to forgive yourself of sin. Maybe you've been trying to do all you can to work yourself out of your sin. Trying to do good, trying to, to pay off these debts of sin and Jesus is saying I'm the only one who can do it I'm the only one that can cleanse you and forgive you of all your unrighteousness I'm the only one because I'm the only one Jesus would say that led a sinless life yet took all of man's sins upon himself he's the only one he's the only one today that can bring you the peace that you're searching for he is the only one today that can bring you the hope that is everlasting. He's the only one today that can guarantee you the promise of eternal life. In fact, he's the one that says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Amen? Amen. He is the only one. I can't do it myself. And when I look to the promised land and I see it, I will be honest with you, I'm just like Israel many times, and I look and I see what's ahead before me, and I think, nope, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. God says, it's already yours. It's already yours. And the same today, when we see the enemy working, we think, he's going to defeat us. But guess what? He's already been defeated. He has already been defeated. And what he does is, he says, let me tempt you. Let me bring doubt into your life. Let me get you to think that I am going to defeat you, which will be the biggest lie in the book because he has already been defeated. He's the world's biggest and worst loser. And he wants to convince us today that no, I haven't lost. You're going to lose. He's the father of all lies. Maybe you've bought into those lies. Maybe you've had a report around you of negativity of people telling you, God can't do that. God won't forgive you. God won't heal you. God won't set you free from that. Maybe you're in a place where you think God can't do it or he won't do it. And God's telling you, I've already done it. I've already paid it all just Live in my promise. Here's the reality. Glenn, if you want to head up, you can. This is the reality. At that very moment that Caleb said, let's go in and let's get the promised land. Continuing on from that very chapter, the story would have been very different. We would have been reading about them in the promised land. But instead, we get to now go forward and read about them for 40 years of being boneheads in the wilderness. And God's still saying, fine, fine, I'll take you back. Fine, I'll lead you. 
Fine, I'll guide you. But the reality is, as we're going to see, just as he was faithful to the covenant to say, I will give you the land, he is going to be faithful to deliver the consequence. And I don't know about you guys, but as a parent, there's times, I'm just going to be honest with you, there's times that I enjoy giving out a consequence. I don't know about any other parents here enjoy that. You're like, I can't wait to give this one out. But I'll be honest with you, the same time, there's many times that I do not like having to be the guy who gives out the consequence. And sometimes we think, if I could just spare my kid from the consequence, if I could take the consequence upon myself, but you know what? It's through those very consequences that our kids learn from their mistake. And these people going forward for the next 40 years, we're going to see they still remained God's chosen. They still remained God's people. He still was their father, their provider, their caretaker. He still went before them. But we're going to see because of this grave mistake and their hard-heartedness, they would not be able to inherit the promise. God would do it through someone else. So... Let's not miss out what God has for us. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand together, if you would. First Corinthians eleven twenty four says this, and he had given thanks, and he broke it and said, "This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me." In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me." This right here, ladies and gentlemen, we know. There's some churches that will teach today that this literally is the body and blood of Jesus. And, and I know for a fact it's not because I ordered this, these cups on Amazon just, just a few days ago. But what Jesus said was that as we do this, what it resembles and signifies is his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. And we're to do this and partake of it in remembrance of what he has done says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We do this knowing what he's done for us through the cross and through his resurrection. But we do this also knowing that what he did on that cross and on that third day from rising from the dead, he still is coming for us. We're to remember what he's done for us as we wait for him to come back for us. Amen? Amen. He will do it. He's coming back. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to take the bread and the juice and to remember what you are faithful to do, Jesus, on our behalf. The bottom line is every one of us in this room deserved the cross. But Jesus, you took it for us. You were the only one that could wipe out sin at one very moment. The sin of the past, the sin of the present day that you, Lord, took upon yourself at that very moment and the sin of the future that we have committed and the sin that even goes before us, Lord, you, at one single moment, you took care of it. You were the only one. And God, today we do this in remembrance of you and we ask that you would again, Lord, forgive us this morning of our sins. Forgive us, Lord, of our hard hearts. Forgive us, Lord, of our stubbornness. Forgive us, Lord, of the times where we know that the land is flowing with milk and honey. We've tasted and we've seen, yet we still maybe don't go in to possess it because we're afraid or fearful. Meet us, Lord. Increase our faith. 
Fill us afresh with your hope, Jesus. And wash us with your blood today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.